Now turn to part one. Part one. You are about to hear a conversation between a man and a woman who are having a discussion about enrolling in a university course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now, listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Registrar's office, this is Pam. Yes, hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number? Yes, this is Mitchburg University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school. I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first year and transferring students, and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you? No, not really. I'll tell you what. Why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D-R-E-Y-F-U-S. Your address there, Richard? Unit 12, 15 Sportsman Avenue. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-M-A-N, Mermaid Beach, 4554. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. Uh, 0414, hang on a minute, I don't call myself usually. Uh, I think it's 0414, 658-339. Yes, that's it. Okay, now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. Dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. For me. Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best, uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure, there are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep, yeah, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear the organizer of a group holiday talking to the group before they arrive at their destination. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Thank you everybody for your attention. I hope you're all looking forward to arriving at the town. I thought you might like to know a few things while we're still on the coach and it'll help to pass the time on our journey. Okay, as you know, we're staying at the Park Hotel. It's comfortable and friendly. We're booked in for three nights. Now, I'm aware that not everyone wants breakfast there, so if you do want it, you should tell the hotel that you do the night before. We're making our own arrangements for dinner each evening, and there's a cafe open at the hotel most of the time if you want a drink or a snack. There's also a very pleasant lounge on the ground floor with a collection of fascinating paintings. And then I hope you're going to enjoy the various activities that are lined up. However, I do have to tell you that there have been some changes since the original programme, for one, because it's been restored and is therefore closed to the public, we won't be going to the castle after all, I'm afraid. However, there's plenty else to see, and the gardens are still open. Something we've been able to add to the programme is for Saturday, when a local historian will give us a lecture on famous people from the town. I don't know who that includes yet. So, to free up the time for that, we've made another little amendment, and changed the trip to the antique show that was due for then on to Sunday. Actually, I think that'll make for a more relaxed programme anyway. We're leaving the rest of Sunday free for you to wander around as you wish. One place you might like to try is the art gallery, because it's got a huge display of old postcards. You can't really send them home to your family and friends, but it's interesting and sometimes funny to see what people used to send. Well, um, that's the lot on changes. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 17 to 20. I thought it could be useful to try and get your bearings now before we actually arrive, so I'll give you a few pointers on your maps. OK, um, first things first. The Park Hotel, because I assume you'll want to deposit your luggage before anything else. We'll be driving into the town from the west and stopping at the bus station. To get to the hotel, just go straight down the high street towards the railway bridge and after the bridge, if you go left, you'll soon see it on the right. As I say, it's a nice place. You can check in, see your rooms, relax a little. There are a couple of interesting little shops nearby. There aren't any internet facilities at the hotel, I'm afraid, so if you want to send any emails, you'll need to get yourselves to the internet cafe. In fact, if you want to do that first, it's easy because it's near the bus station, on the corner towards the right of Curtis Lane and Kramer Street. So, once you've done that... If you do that, then I suppose you'll be ready to do a bit of exploring. You've got your basic maps, but you may want to get more information, and the Tourist Information Office is the place to do that. It's up around the train station area. From the bus station, you could go up any of the streets to the left, Cadogan Road, Earl Street or Duke Street. The office is directly facing the train station on the corner with Earl Street. They've got all sorts of brochures and leaflets about local attractions and tickets for sale. They even sell some locally produced jams and chocolates. And a last pointer at this stage is our venue for dinner tonight, the Royal House Restaurant. This is conveniently located in the very centre of town. In fact, you'll no doubt pass it as you're walking around beforehand. In relation to the bus station, it's not far. Going down the High Street, if you pass the corner with Cromwell Road, then the next junction is a crossroads with Duke Street and Runton Road, and it's there you'll be able to see its rather grand entrance over on the left corner. The food and the service there are both excellent, so it promises to be an enjoyable evening. Well, uh, we're just coming into the town now, so... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well. There are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself what do you really enjoy studying. For example, math, English, science. This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the dean of academic affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay. Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at, which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now, some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now, let me just get my pen. Okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do? It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read. Although Judy Newton's Choosing University Courses was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm. Let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes, there was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Hmm. <clears throat> I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers, and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is, you really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. 
you will hear a writer giving a talk about the different kinds of writing that the audience might want to try doing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. So, I'm now going to say a few words about the various different kinds of writing you may want to consider. Each has its own challenges and rewards, and it's really a question of seeing what suits you best. There are no rights and wrongs here. Let's start by considering the short story. Remember that a short story isn't just a very concise novel. There are three basic styles. The story itself, the slice of life section, and the surprise type, and all of them are equally valid as treatments of the genre. When producing a short story, you don't have time for a slow build-up of interest, so you need to get in there straight away and begin with a crisis. Then there's non-fiction, which can sell very well, with biographies in particular frequently hitting the bestseller lists. It's important, however, to be sure your chosen topic is genuinely interesting to people, and you know enough about it to do it justice. So, when you're submitting your idea to a publisher, it's worthwhile to give them details of specialist knowledge you have. What about articles? Now, this is a very wide area, of course, going from the very learned and obscure to the populist gossip type. Articles based on giving advice are a proven area, and to give them a sufficient focus, you should produce your article for a definite market. That will help to define your purpose. Turning to something different, there's the question of poetry. It's often hard to define what poetry is exactly. Maybe it's easier to say what it isn't. But it should be subtle, so the message of a poem oughtn't to be overly obvious. True poems let the ideas sit there for the reader to ponder. What they must do is sound good, like singing. So I recommend reading what you write aloud to yourself to check the melody. Well, then there's plays, which are basically novels, but told only through conversation. A playwright includes minimal instructions for actions, but not for every small action the actors will perform. Things such as moves towards sofa and so on are for the director to come up with. If you're thinking of trying your hand at a play, a good starting point would be to educate yourself a little in the art of acting, so that you know what the people who deliver your work can and can't do with it. What next? There's radio, of course. Radio uses an enormous range of material, and the BBC Writing for Radio handbook contains information about all of this. To begin with, I suggest regional stations for sending your stuff to. The competition for national radio is extremely high. OK, another interesting area is children's literature. Now, very few, if any, children's books are published without pictures. But this doesn't mean that you, as writer, have to draw them. That's for the illustrator. What you do need to do is be clear who you want to write for. So fix on one age group, and then aim your stories at that. Right, I've saved what I consider to be the best, and the hardest, till last. The novel. Very long and very difficult to do well. But certainly not impossible, as any bookshop shelves will confirm. One of the first things to decide is from what point of view you will tell your story. A popular choice is the first person, and this technique certainly gives a sense of immediacy for the reader while many new writers find it easier to project themselves into their main character if they can write in his or her name. But that assumes, of course, that the main character is somehow like the writer, which may or may not be the case. Meanwhile, if your book is all narrated by I, you can only put into your story things which are experienced by that character, which may prove to be rather restricting. Now, there are all sorts of pitfalls for the novelist and many of them relate to the issue of providing a balanced narrative. Every time you introduce a character into the story, you have decisions to make. Of course, you want to populate your landscape with a variety of people to maintain interest, but don't feel you have to decorate every one of them in elaborate detail. The same goes for irony. All too often, an inexperienced writer will create a strong ironic situation, 
and then spoil it by spelling out what they mean by it, as if readers were too stupid to understand. A few contrasting details should serve to make the point clear. A big challenge for new novelists is dialogue. What is the relationship between conversation as people really speak and as it is in novels? Well, it depends. If you recorded actual conversations and copied them straight into your narrative, readers would get confused and bored, all those unfinished sentences going nowhere. On the other hand, you don't want to write out page-long utterances by characters, as these will seem unrealistic to an extreme, but you can insert minor descriptions and actions to vary the pace and add interest. Well, I hope what I'm saying is encouraging and not too off-putting about the various difficulties. Are there any questions at this point? That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Describe an activity you do for your health or fitness you should say, what you do, how often you do it, where you do it, and explain how you think this activity helps you stay healthy or fit. To remain healthy and fit is every person's greatest goal. Likewise, I used to set goals to join a gym like every other youth out there as a new year resolution, but unfortunately, I would procrastinate and it's like I didn't care about it anymore. As a techie, I used to sit for hours before my system. As a result, I developed a paunch. I didn't notice it at first. It was during the pandemic lockdown I came to know of this. So, after discussing with my family members, I learned that a morning walk would be a better option. Therefore, along with my cousin, who also has this issue, I decided to try morning walk from the next day onwards. The next morning we began walking for a few kilometers. But as we progress with our walk each day by increasing our distance, it gradually profits us with visible results. Within a month of walking, I could reduce my belly fat to a minimum. Now I think, if there is a mind to do a certain task and we ready our mind for it, we can achieve it. Now I am exercising regularly and I am no longer concerned about my health issues because I believe it is the mind which needs to be trained and the body will follow it.